evening, everybody. Hope that you are all doing quite well tonight. I uh, got a couple of announcements before we sing some songs together. First of all, uh, hopefully you got your announcements. If you didn't, contact the office. Uh, make sure that we get those to you. There are a couple of prayer requests uh, that you want to make note of. Uh, sermon shares this weekend, Friday and Saturday. As we've been saying, we'll have some area preachers uh, looking at... Uh, preaching various uh, chapters. Each one gets one specific chapter they're supposed to talk about. You know, how do they come up with this outline, that kind of thing. So uh, if you're interested in being a part of that, if you want to come listen to a bunch of preachers talk, uh, we'd love to have you. Just kind of give me a heads up if you want lunch so that I make sure to uh, count for everybody. Uh, we have our annual meeting on Sunday. I've been told Craig promises it'll be five minutes or less. Is John Batty the one leading this? I'm assuming the answer is yes. Oh, okay. Maybe 10 minutes then? Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, of course not. Okay, five minutes or less. Uh, basically, all we need you to say is yes. Uh, if you plan to say no, stay home. Uh... Parking lot is being done <laughs> 13th to the 16th of this month, which is next Wednesday through Friday. Um, oh, I have 13th through 16th. So 13th through the 15th. Um, On the 16th. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. All right. On that note, we're going to move forward. Yes, sir. And then we have a new member breakfast on the 23rd. Basically, if you've never attended one or uh, if you're new, it gives us an opportunity to try and get to know each other. But we want to know who all is coming, so give us a heads up. That is the 23rd, which is, I think, the last Saturday of this month. No, next last Saturday of this month. All right. Let's pray together as we get started. Now, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to come together as your children, uh, to come together as your family thankful for the opportunity to learn more about you, uh, the opportunity to encourage one another. We ask you bless our time together. Lord, we ask you to be with all those who might be in our hearts and our minds. We ask you work in every situation as only you can. Lord, we ask you to be with us this evening and that all things be done to your glory. We love you and pray to be with you in Christ's name. Amen. All righty. First song tonight is going to be number 895. Number 895. like to stay here longer than man's allotted days and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory 
By and by, I'll tell and sing love story. There on high, there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory. By and by, I want to be of service along this pilgrim way and lead the lost to Jesus as fervently I pray. As day by day I travel, I'll keep him ever nigh and live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory. By and by, I'll tell and sing love story. There on high. Dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. The end I know is nearing. By faith I look away to yonder home supernal, the land of endless day. I'll cling to him forever and look beyond the sky and live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory. By and by, I'll tell and sing love story. There on high, there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory. By and by. Uh, next song is number 957. Number 957. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore They're all expecting me and that's one thing I know My Savior pardoned me and now I onward go I know he'll take me through though I am weak and poor And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. All right, number last one for the evening is number 315. Number 315. When I survey the one dress cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow me go down. Did e'er 
such love and sorrow meet. O thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature So amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my We've had two quick updates for the prayer list. Richard Brooks left on Tuesday morning for Kentucky. Um, his brother was in the hospital with pneumonia, not doing well. They've upgraded, upgraded, downgraded his cancer diagnosis to stage four lung cancer, and now concerned that it's metastasized elsewhere, including into his bone marrow. Um, anyway, so I took Richard to the airport Tuesday morning. He's in Kentucky. They've sent his brother home from the hospital with pain management. Um, Richard had enough of a sense of humor to text me tonight that there was a lot of bickering going on. Typical Kentucky family, I guess. This particular family has a habit of bickering with each other. <laughs> yeah, Hatfield McCoy country. And also I just found out in the last five minutes that Mike Vernon's uh, in the ER with some complications I, I believe related to the start of his chemotherapy, something to do with uh, bowel troubles, etc. cetera. And uh, Vern sent me a note that they're with um, uh, Mike uh, and Kelly. So keep Mike Vernon in your prayers. All right, well, on that note, Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Wednesday Night Huddle. Uh, we've been in the midst of Matthew, the theme of which is uh, the kingdom of God. And over and over again, Matthew talks in terms of the kingdom of God is, is like, or uh, implicitly says that the, this is how people in the kingdom would behave. And uh, everything focuses upon that the true king, the king of righteousness, has arisen and is ushering in the kingdom of God, the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament has been prophesying. Uh, last week we began Matthew chapter 12. This week we're going to pick up, uh, we already did Matthew chapter 12 beginning in verse 1, so we're going to pick up in verse 9. If I can get somebody to read chapter 12 verses 9 through 14 for me please. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand and they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Thank you. Remind me what happened beginning in verse 1. In verses 1 through 8, what took place? Because all this is flowing out of, uh, uh, out of what took place there. For verse 9, he went on from there. So what happened back in verses 1 through 8? Does anybody remember? The grain fields episode where they were hungry walking through the grain fields and rubbed kernels of grain between their hands and ate the grain. Yeah, 
and specifically on the Sabbath, on in which the, Sabbath. the Pharisees asked the question, why are they uh, doing work on the Sabbath? And you may recall last week how we talked about uh, all these different laws and how uh, the, the Israelites and the Pharisees had started out probably trying with good motives to avoid breaking the law, but in so doing had created a series of laws that made it to where they could no longer see the purpose of the original law and had created all these traditions and elevated them to the level of law. And we ended last week talking about how uh, that traditions are good. There's nothing wrong with traditions. Where we enter into a realm of wrongness is when we elevate our tradition to the same level as the word of God because then we, well, begin to uh, camouflage what the actual word is and lose sight of what the actual command is. So going on from there, we encounter this scenario. What, what does the Pharisees' question to Jesus, what does it reveal about their heart? Yes. They were more concerned with the law, the traditions, than the condition of the individual. They're more concerned about the law than the condition of the individual. What else do they appear to be more concerned of? What are they? They're focusing on the law, but not only above the man's condition, but above what else? For yes, the question is what's right to do, but eventually this hand is healed and they still seem to be focused upon the law and they are focused so much upon work was done during the Sabbath that they miss the healing of this man's hand. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Yes, sir. It looks like they were just more interested in and concerned about uh, finding fault with Jesus, no matter what he did. That does seem to be the case. Yes. Uh, because if you recall, they, they've left the field where Jesus has corrected their misunderstanding of the law and tradition, and they go straight from that of how dare your Pharisees, or your Pharisees, how dare your disciples do work on the Sabbath. Now we're going into the temple that same Sabbath, that same day, and he's healing a man, and the Pharisees see, still seem to be after him because perhaps, at least in part, because of what takes place there, uh, with, the, uh, there with Jesus' correction of them. What is significant about the description of the healing of the man's hand? How is the hand described? Withered. Okay, it's withered. And how is it described after the healing? The same as the other. Why is that significant? Now he has two left hands. Well, he, he didn't, he didn't he just... He was either left or right, we're not sure which. He didn't just restore the function of the hand. <laughs> he restored the hand in all fullness. He could have given the guy functionality of that hand, but he went a step further and restored it to its, one assumes, its original, um, what was the intended composition of his hand. It's interesting that in, in all the healings that Jesus does, with perhaps the exception of one, and I think that one's in Mark, uh, th immediately the individual is restored to complete full health. That those who were lame are now able to fully walk. And if you've ever seen someone who's only beginning to regain the control of their legs, it's a long process. Some of you might have physical therapy, uh, that wonderful thing that they disguise under the name of physical therapy, the torture they disguise underneath the name physical therapy. And it takes a long time. If you've ever seen someone whose legs have atrophied, it takes a long time. If you've ever seen someone's arm that hasn't been utilized, I'm reminded of a commercial. I don't remember what it was about now. It was 10 is bigger than 1 or 20 is bigger than 10. It, they had two dumbbells and one arm was significantly larger than the other. Why? Because one arm was used more. Well, same thing. with If you have a withered hand and then suddenly you begin to be able to reuse that hand, well, that hand hasn't been used in a long time. It's going to look funny. 
It's going to be smaller. It's not going to be as usable as the other hand. But in this case, he has full use of the hand just like the other one. That in each case where Jesus heals, it's not just that this person regains function, but that they are completely healed. Can't help but wonder if perhaps there's a theological undertone associated with that. Now, back here, hold on, back here, and then up here. I think about uh, you know we talk about Christ making us perfect. He made this person perfect in terms of his health, so he re, you know that's what Christ can do for the whole person, and that's this is just an example of. This individual is now made perfect through Christ. Yeah. Made perfect, not just simply healed, but brought to completion. I was watching a faith healer on television at one time, and uh, some parents brought an adult son up to the faith healer that couldn't talk. And so he prayed for the ch for the, this son and then told them that Jesus had healed him, but they needed to take him home and now teach him how to talk, as opposed to the instant nature of the real miracles. Yeah. What is significant about the method by which Jesus heals this man? He doesn't touch him. Okay, he doesn't touch him. No sport coat. Okay. He doesn't touch him. What does he do? He tells him to stretch it out. Okay. He says, stretch out your hand. And why is that significant? I think he wanted everybody to see. Okay. Certainly. Okay, withered hand can't stretch. That's also significant. Remind me what he's been accused of doing what the whole concern is. Working on the Sabbath. Working on the Sabbath. And all Jesus did was talk. So he almost pulls the rug out from underneath the accusation because what did he actually do? They didn't actually do anything. He simply told the man to stretch out his hand. Jesus doesn't touch him. He doesn't grab him by the hand. He doesn't stretch his hand out. But all Jesus does is simply says something. So it's almost as if the accusation, is it, right to, is it right to work on the Sabbath? Well, Jesus says, I'll show you, if you will. <laughs> I'm sure he said it just like that. I'll show you all. <laughs> I'll show you now. But it's, go ahead. I think it's also significant. I mean, I think it's significant that he does these on the Sabbath because I think he's, Again, trying to make the point that the old is out and the new is in. And he also, in this, as he's done in other, in other healing situations, he didn't say to the man, your faith has healed you. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. That in this case, Jesus seems to go find the man. Now, we're not actually told what the scenario is as to how it comes about. But as opposed to the other miracles where someone seeks out Jesus, there's no record of... Jesus being sought out. That almost as though Jesus does this to prove a point. And what do you think the point is that he's trying to prove or get at? Okay, certainly uh, that he is God and that this is, uh, that he is ushering in something that is, uh, is the fulfillment of the law. Anything else that he might be trying to get at? Yes. You know, at that time, uh, they, they had come up with some of their own laws, and they weren't laws, but uh, things that it allowed you to take a, a, a sheep and take care of that sheep. Uh, and he says in verse 12, you know, isn't a man's hand or isn't a man more valuable than, than a sheep? Okay, that's true, to, sh to show the value of the individual that, uh, as will be said later, that man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for man. I think it's interesting, too. My reading of verse 10 is this was a setup. It's, it could easily be a setup. Because the whole thing that started this was in, in verse 10, and, and uh, a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Before anything was done, 
And it sounds to me like they've set, uh, they've set Jesus up. They've set a trap. Of course, at the end, they end up stepping in it, in set, the trap that is, yeah. instead of, uh, uh, instead of uh, him stepping into it. And how unfortunate for the man. He shows up to the synagogue trying to worship God uh, with his hand withered and suddenly becomes the focal point of everything. Yes? Uh, Jesus is God on earth, and so God has said it is permitted to, go, to do good on the Sabbath. That's it. That's part of it as well, because Jesus has just gotten through saying that the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath, and he shows that he has power to work on the Sabbath, and that all he need to do is speak on the Sabbath. Hold on, we've got back here, uh, uh, Miss ah. Galeen. Am I pronouncing your name right? Galeen? G-A-Y. Well, I wasn't even close. Okay. <laughs> all right. What I always think about in this uh, scripture is the fact that he will, later on, it says he was without sin, and they still killed him. And I think what he's trying to point out is the fact of show them the laws, show them everything, but I'm not doing anything wrong. You are going to crucify me for no reason, I, except for the fact that that uh, they resented that, that they thought he was that he thought he was God. So that in the end of it all, he really could say, "I was, I followed the law to the letter, but you still crucified me." It's true that it's interesting that Jesus points out the flaws but never breaks the law. That he keeps the law to the nth degree, but he still manages to point out the flaws associated with, with, with their current understanding and approach. Was there another hand someplace? Why not? In verse 10, when it says, and the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Um, if people have wicked hearts, there's nothing you can do for them. If you had been standing in a synagogue and you knew this guy and he, he saw this hand all crippled up, and suddenly, just like that, it's normal, just from the speaking of a word, what would your response be? Would it be, let's kill him? So, you know, sometimes we feel guilty because we've shared the gospel with someone and we just can't get through to them. And we have to understand it depends on the condition of the heart. There are people for whom if Jesus were to appear today and work a miracle in front of him, they'd be standing there a month later yelling, crucify him, crucify him. That's true. Any other thoughts before we move on to our next question? Yes, ma'am. It seems to me that they have no love for their fellow man. Here this person was just healed instead of expressing some joy for him, for his new life that he's going to now enjoy with this. Not an ounce, not an ounce of love for their fellow man that I see when we read their activity. It seems to be true, and Jesus seems to point it out um, so far at least twice with Hosea. Uh, we talked last week about twice uh, Jesus has quoted Hosea 6. Uh, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Uh, he seems to also use it uh, to point out his divinity, or at least in conjunction with that. Uh, but exactly what you're saying as well, that uh, twice Jesus tries to remind them up to this point uh, of, of you've, you've elevated the law over and above its purpose of leading us to where we can have mercy and understand God. Uh, and we see that uh, acted out here. Any other thoughts? They've witnessed, a, they've witnessed a miracle, but they have to play it down because they don't want to continue giving Jesus any more credibility than, than he's already gaining. So they have to put the emphasis on the fact that he is doing something wrong and taking people's eyes off the fact that a miracle was just performed. Uh, a lot of intentionality to try and get uh, focus off of a miracle. Yes. In the Talmud, of reading here, there's a lot of uh, things that were exceptions and so forth. And uh, you know, the, the question is, if he was healing on the Sabbath, are they uh, able to punish him on the Sabbath? Okay. 
question. I don't know. I hope you like the people you sit next to. Now, we're going to try our group thing again. You may wonder why in the world we do that. We do it for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because there's a tendency with every uh, larger group for there to be a few voices for the overall group, which is great. Uh, but we want to try and hear from as many people as possible. Um, two, as we discuss what we see, we usually are able to learn more together. And so I'm curious, based on what we see here, what is one potential danger that the Pharisees' actions reveal? A uh, danger that would be applicable to us. For, for we see the results of their hearts, but, but what is one danger that we see associated with this scenario? Uh, and what is one ideally practical way that we can try uh, and avoid the, this particular scenario uh, in our lives? Do the questions make sense? Okay, I'm sensing no. Uh, my question is this. What are the potential dangers to us that we see or the potential ways in which we can find ourselves in the same boat that the Pharisees were at this moment? For we rec we've all recognized their hard hearts. What are the potential ways in which we can get there, if you will, based upon this scenario? And how can we try and avoid that scenario? Does that make sense? Okay, I see more heads this time, so we'll go with that one. Easier. No, it's not an easy question. You have roughly five minutes. Good luck.
guess. I, I know it's not enough time to fully uh, pursue the question. Uh, I know it's, or per questions. Uh, I know that we could spend a lot of time trying to pursue and trying to work through them together. But in the interest of getting you out of here sometime before midnight, uh, I thought it was best to move on. You're welcome. 11.59 is before midnight. So what do you think? How do we avoid getting to the place that the Pharisees were? Okay, that love has to be our motivation. that we are to practice love and show grace, especially in the areas where God is not overtly explicit as to exactly what we are supposed to do. Uh, for Paul acknowledges that such places exist, otherwise we wouldn't have matters of conscience. Uh, and in, uh, perhaps there is no greater place where love and grace is needed. And in those matters of conscience, for because it's a matter of conscience, we tend to believe it very strongly. And that's good. But if we lose the love and grace, we risk finding ourselves in this exact predicament. Somebody else. Pass the mic around. When we fall into the traditions of men, and they like they were doing, and it becomes what guides us. And I, I think we probably all have experienced some of those traditions of men that have been put on us, and they've also split many, many congregations. Traditions so sometimes do that. Now, I am from a generation that many of my uh, fellow millennials would argue that we should eliminate traditions. I don't know that we should go so far as to eliminate traditions, for traditions are good. Uh, they help us create culture. We, can't, we, we have to have traditions. Also, there are some things that have survived the test of time for a reason, and they are beneficial, such as some of the hymns that we sing, that we look down, and man, that date is 1600. There's a reason why it's existed for so long. That being said, we have to recognize where tradition ends and where the word of God begins, or vice versa. Somebody else? I think we have to remain and stay in the word. Okay. I mean, that's really what we have to do, because this, I mean, Every day there's new things pulling at us to take us away from that, and many of them are t our traditions. And so staying, staying in the Word, and I mean, not there's, there's also a lot of people that would attempt to interpret the Word so that it fits their lives and the things that they're doing. So. Yeah, and that's hard because because we are flawed individuals, we will always bring our perceptions, our history, uh, our uh, culture, everything that is us, we always bring that to the word and filter the word through that. And the challenge is trying to focus on what is the word saying as opposed to what would I like it to say. Oh, somebody from over on this side. Yes, sir. Well, in our, in our group here, uh, Leanne is the one who pointed out the same thing, that uh, the practical way to avoid this danger is through our love that we have for one another. Okay. So here again, it's love. Well, we, we have to, to show love and have to care about people who are around us. Yes, yes ma'am. I know it was a short time, but I was just thinking afterward that there's a verse, and I don't remember where it is, but submit to one another in love. And the word submit to one another, and that we're also to submit to our elders. Um, they should have been submitting to Christ, and they didn't. Um, we're not really submitting to the law. We're submitting to uh, leadership, and, of course, the head of our church is Jesus Christ. So yeah, as long as they're following the truth. True. Somebody over here in this, this corner. Miss Laura, you always like to speak. You have been elected a spokesperson. No, I've got nothing to say. Oh. Nothing to say? Wow. Could you repeat that? <laughs> I'm taking the night off. I'm just you 
you're taking the night off. You know, we all need one of those sometimes. Uh, Terry, did I see your hand? Write a note to Leanne. Uh, that passage that she was referring to uh, it starts out in uh, uh, Ephesians 5 and in verse uh, 21. It says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then it talks about wives submitting to their husbands. And then it goes on to talk about children sub submitting to their parents. And then it goes on to having to do slaves submit to their masters. And so all of this thing is that the reverence we show for, for God's word and for his instruction. Uh, and the, uh, a lot of people ha tend to uh, be more subjective about, you know, well, you know, if that's the way he's gonna be, well, I'll just show him. And uh, that is not the, the way we, d we do that. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, a lot of times when uh, they s start talking about husbands and wives, uh, the husbands like to read, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord, uh, and we forgot the one that says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And in, in doing that, uh, when we're doing that and we're looking at God's word and we're uh, objectively looking at the, what we have to learn, we need to learn that from, uh, from examples of good Christians who are living that way, and we need to uh, ultimately be looking at God's word to make sure we're doing those things and we're looking at it objectively, not making a judgment of what we would like to have. Uh, what I'm hearing you guys say is, is the importance of practicing humility. Uh, that as we approach the text, uh, as we approach God, that it's essential that we uh, approach from humility, recognizing we don't know everything. Uh, recognizing that it is possible that what we, the conclusions we have arrived at might be wrong and we should double check. Uh, in addition to everything you get, but uh, anybody else have any thoughts? Once, twice, two and three quarters. Okay. In addition to everything you guys said, there was one that I'm not sure that we can avoid. And that is losing our awe. Because if I look at what the Pharisees struggle with, we, we notice that they, they passed right over the miracle that was done before them. They knew the law backwards, forwards, and inside out. For to be a Pharisee was to have memorized all of it to the extent that they could count the number and count the uh, letters on a page and know which letter was going to be in the middle. They knew it backwards, forwards, inside out, upside down, left ways and right. But in this moment, it's almost as though they lost the awe of God. Some of us have been Christians for a long time. We've heard the stories. We've heard, Jesus loves me, this I know, and we've heard it over and over and over and over again, and that's great and that's wonderful. And we should be thankful that we have had the opportunity and the privilege to be Christians for, for such a long time. But there is a potential danger that we can lose the awe of Jesus died for me. The, the awe of, uh, of a God who is the supreme ruler of the universe thought it worthwhile to reveal himself so that we could know what he wants us to do. When he had no reason other than just his desire to, no, no obligation. And I don't know that it's possible to entirely avoid that challenge because we've heard the story so much, because we've practiced reading our Bible so much. I don't know that it's possible to go through life without hitting some kind of rut at some point in time. We find ourselves just a little bit stuck. And I'm curious... From those of you who have experience either with trying to get out of the rut or having been faithful for so long, how do you avoid that? Or how, how do you manage to get out of that rut so as not to lose the awe of the God that we serve? What do you think? I, 
I think sometimes there might even be a tendency to resent the awe. Okay. Can you elaborate? Well, here I find myself, uh, you know, 65 years uh, uh, after 40 plus years of discipleship. Uh, everything from uh, scriptural knowledge to life experience, yet my salvation is exactly worth what the salvation of the 64 and a half year old man who decides to come forward next Sunday and recommit himself. That's fair. And from time to time you feel like, wow. Huh. Is that an example of, and, and, and by the way, the, the saving of the 64 and a half year old, that's the awe. Uh, yes, ma'am. The awe is gone. <laughs> For a while, our ladies had a book, and it was teaching about how many of us sing the songs and actually knows what the so what the words are saying. You get so used to singing these songs, or how many times is there prayer being said? And your mind has jumped off someplace else, which Satan is very good about. So I think the all comes whenever we brought, bring our minds into worship time and keep it there instead of out in the world someplace thinking about your car broke down or, or you're hungry or kid next door, you know, sitting next to you is making noise. We have to learn to control our minds to bring that worship time when we're here. Yes. No mumbling. No mumbling. Okay. Uh, for me, being someone who has not lived as a Christian my entire life, uh, only nine years ago uh, did I turn my life over to Christ as my Savior. And for me, it's a constant reminder daily of the awesomeness of Christ and the ability to save someone like myself, the things that I've gone through in my life, and to be absolutely, thoroughly blessed that that is in my past and that I am a new creation as a result of my decision and as a result of this man's wisdom to bring me to Christ. So it just, it's something that uh, I, I start my day and end my day just thanking the Lord for what he's done for me. So it's uh, just a different thought from someone who hasn't, although I started out in the Church of Christ but then left it for almost 40 years. So it's a, uh, to me it's an awesome thing every single day to just simply wake up and, and thank the Lord for uh, having gone to the cross and died for the sins that I committed because they were many. Glad you're here. Yes. Twenty years ago, I was at a a meeting of the church that met on Bell Road, and they called it Bell Church of Christ. And uh, Ed Wharton was preaching a meeting there. There was a man, ninety-three years old made his decision to follow Jesus Christ. That congregation didn't have a baptistry. So he came here and he was, the man was baptized right here in, in surprise, 93 years old. And Ed Wharton was here and the uh, preacher that was preaching there at the time. And he, he was just in a way kind of asking questions about, you know, well, who are these people that meet here? We were members here at that time. And uh, so I was explaining, and there was a, a gigantic pulpit up there that looked like it could have been a piano or an organ. He wanted to know what that thing was. <laughs> but in, in doing that, Ed Wharton today is somewhere in the same age now, still serving, still teaching. And so it's a lifelong uh, 
uh, ministry for him and uh, becoming mature or perfect is a lifelong endeavor for every man. I used to work for a guy who favored the saying, today is the first day of the rest of your life. And the point he was trying to make is that we should act like it. And, you know, it, it, it was both a valuation of the value of what lie in front of us, but also a pretty strong commentary on leaving behind behind. He used to say, uh, was it, and I don't think he, this was his original saying, he used to say, if you ever notice, the windshield's real big and the rear view mirror is real small. Familiarity breeds contempt, and that's one of the challenges we face. Think about, uh, you're not old enough to remember this, but a few of us are. Uh, the first time we bought a car that had air conditioning in it, and how amazing, absolutely amazing. I mean, we go for a ride just to experience the air conditioning. Today we get in the car and we don't think about it. Uh, the first time uh, you were uh, bought a microwave was like $600, $1,300, I don't know what it was, for a microwave, and you were making $400 a week. And, and how amazing it was to be able to turn that dial on the microwave and push a button and get it to work that quickly. And now we just walk in, we throw something in it, pop the button and walk away, and we don't think anything of it. And we, if we're not careful, we can become the, the same way with the Lord. And there's a phrase in the, in the book of Psalms that I think of often, where he says, open my eyes that I might see. And I think we need to pray often for wisdom that God will open our eyes to help us to see Another example of this is to any of us that, that moved to Arizona, I can remember years when we would come to Arizona for two weeks and we would spend a month's wages just to get here and it was just this awesome, amazing weather. And now that we've been here for 10 years, it's just weather. I mean, we appreciate it, but not like we did back then. But when it comes to God, we can't afford to let that happen. We have to keep that all. But I'm in awe every day when I look at the sunset, when I look at the sunrise, when I look at mountains, when I look at trees or even grass or anything of nature, I am in awe of what he's given us. And I think we can't take that for granted. I mean, every more every time you see that, just it's amazing. And he's given us air to breathe every single day. And I think we take that for granted, but think about if that was, you know, we do take that for granted, but it's from him. It's true. We have a painting in our living room that is, uh, it's like looking up through a valley in, New Mexico, and, and the, the artist was a member of the church in Grand Prairie, Texas, who did it. As, he did this painting from a photograph that his brother sent him. He was a pharmacist on an Indian reservation. But he titled the uh, painting, Clear Understanding, and, and then referenced Romans 120. And, and, and what Bonnie just said, reminds me so much of that, right? We are, we are without excuse when it comes to being in awe, first and foremost, because of the fact that we are experiencing God's creation with multiple senses in multiple ways every single day. I don't have the experience that some of you do. And so I can't speak from experience. All I can do is speak from, I wonder if. 
And I can't help but wonder if when we do find ourselves in ruts, that it's essential, A, that we be honest. But we don't really like to admit that we find ourselves there. For it can almost sound as though we are somehow not spiritual enough. Because we, we need to keep our off, which we do. But what happens if that means you wake up tomorrow and I'm just not feeling it today? Does that mean that you have, you're somehow less, you're a second-rate Christian? That we have to be honest when we find ourselves in those scenarios. Because there's no way to get out or move forward and, until we are. There is an element of discipline, or at least seems to be, as some of you have mentioned, that it's talk, the, the Bible talks in terms of spiritual disciplines, which we don't talk about as much. But discipline is rarely fun. Whether it is discipline that one is receiving or whether it is discipline that one is attempting to implement, neither is usually all that much fun. But the gains are appreciated that perhaps there is an element of sometimes we find ourselves just kind of having to struggle through, but it is that struggle that helps us to regain our awe at some point, uh, such as what uh, Sir John of the Cross would describe as the dark night of the soul. And I can't help but wonder if at times it's important to reevaluate the perspective from which we are currently viewing everything. That familiarity brings contempt. So if we continue to do the exact same thing the exact same way perpetually, it is possible that we will lose our awe in that moment. could be the way that we, in which we choose to read the Bible, that we always read it in one particular way, always looking for one particular thing. Perhaps we have to change it up just a little bit. Same thing with the way we sing songs. You mentioned that we always sing songs. Have you noticed that it's usually first, second, and fourth verse? What would happen if you just started with the second verse? People would lose their minds. But there's benefit at times, not changing for the sake of change, but benefit at times of changing things just slightly to change our vantage point, to enable us to have more awe. Perhaps to be honest with those who we find ourselves near, those who we love and trust that are kind of struggling at the moment. but I suspect that all of those aid us in trying to keep our awe of who God is and of what he has done for us. And perhaps if we find ourselves irritated with those who are near around us, uh, the, the little one who just can't seem to be quiet, uh, the new Christian who just, bless their heart, Perhaps we find ourselves overly irritated. Maybe we need to take a step back and ask the question, is it a sign that I have lost my, my awe of this moment? It might not be, but it's a worthwhile question. For it seems to be what the Pharisees did in this particular moment. And that perhaps at least half the battle is being aware that it is a struggle. And that there is an element of discipline associated with it. And that there is a danger that if we're not aware that we could lose our awe, then perhaps we're that much closer to losing it. But that one of our tasks as Christians is to strive to re remember that the God of the universe, simply because he cared and loved us under no obligation, chose to love us enough to send his son, which I do not understand, because if I had to send my son to save you all, I'm sorry, I'll be out of luck. And yet he chose to send his son so that we might have eternity with him simply because he loved us enough. And he loved us enough that he didn't bring us back to where we started, for we started as his creation and we end as his children. We started with God walking beside us in the garden and we end with him being in us. Simply because he loved us. 
Any last thoughts before we wrap up? Let's pray together and we'll be done. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for you. We're so thankful that you are the God you are. Lord, we ask that you forgive us of times when we take you for granted. Uh, help us to keep our awe for you. Lord, we love you and to be with you in Christ's name.